A novelist describes society as an army straggling across the landscape with the leaders up in front quarreling amongst themselves on direction and with outriders riding along the side trying to keep the herd more or less together. Now, there are times, of course, when that army comes to a halt and the leaders are totally at odds with one another about where to go. And on such occasions, it's necessary for the leaders to look back to see where they have been in order to better assess where they are. Now, it's essential for us today to take a look at where we have been because we are Christians and we are part of a Christian army of unimaginable dimensions, an immense, stupendous army with many divisions but united by the belief that Jesus is God Almighty. And we are also members of an army that is beset on all sides by anti-Christian forces. Now, as Christians, we are accustomed to retrospective looks because the, both the Old Testament and the New deal with events of the distant past. And yet I think today it is the Reformation that we should look at because it was the Reformation that rescued Christianity from a previous position in which it stalled and appeared to lose its way. All Western Europe had succumbed to the temptations of wealth and success and the faith had declined. And the general trend of society in the early 16th century was toward totalitarianism in all but name. The kings of France, Spain, and England had reduced the hard-won rights of the people and their representatives and ruled by decree. The city-states of Europe were occupied by usurpers, the people of Western Europe were not only oppressed politically, but also intellectually. These terms, religion and intellect, were in those days interchangeable because the vocabulary of Europe was religious. People thought and argued in religious terms. But Theology was then dominated by a central authority which forbade innovation. Western Europe suffered under a stifling elite. Now that's not to say that everyone was miserable by any means because most people don't seem to demand liberty or to notice its absence. They're too busy providing for themselves and their families and taking care of themselves and are not inclined to look at the imperfections of a society in which they have found out how to function. But on the middle and upper levels of society where there is more leisure, intellectual restrictions begin to make people unhappy and particularly on the upper level individuals become aware of the limitations of individual freedom in the early 16th century such intellectuals found a spokesman in Erasmus his background was mixed despite being illegitimate he was heir to a substantial amount of money but the guardians wanted the money, so they pushed him into a monastery. And although he had little or no religious vocation, he had a great aptitude for learning. He taught himself Greek 
and his Latin was described as equal to Cicero's. He spent a great deal of time in the library. A bishop heard about him and sent him to the University of Paris. And there he abandoned all pretenses about being a monk. He spent several years studying. He also spent several years hard up, lack of money. Then he met two English noblemen who hired him as a tutor and took him with them throughout Europe and then back to England where he met the aristocracy and charmed them out of their shoes, so to speak. He met up-and-coming clergymen. He became a very close personal friend of Sir Thomas More and also of the future Archbishop of Canterbury and money began to pour in. He moved around entertaining and being entertained, and he became famous for his essays all over Europe. Even the Pope wanted him, but he finally settled for the University of Louvain in the Low Countries with a very handsome salary. And from there he conducted an immense correspondence with the highly placed individuals of Europe, rulers, clergymen, so forth, and he made suggestions about the improvement of society and the church. And he knew him from the inside. He spoke, he wrote in elegant Latin. He had no great alternatives, but he spoke for the rootless intellectual, like himself. That meant that nothing changed. But he gave everyone that who read him and who knew of him and who heard his ideas the illusion that liberty was being expanded, although in reality nothing changed. Meanwhile, Luther, son of a farmer, raised by very strict parents, was lucky enough to be sent to school at 17, decided to go to the university and in order to raise the money, sang songs in the street, begged for money. Because in those days, begging in the street was like hitchhiking today. It was no great dishonor to a young boy. And then one of his friends was struck by lightning and Luther took this as a warning from the Lord. And instead of going to the university, he went to a monastery to devote his life to God. And nothing could distinguish Erasmus and Luther more distinctly than this difference of reaction because Erasmus also saw lightning strike. It struck a brothel in a city that he was staying in. And his conclusion was that that proved that you shouldn't keep dry powder in an exposed place. <laughs> And they were also very different, of course, in their attitude toward their vows, because Erasmus took his vows very lightly and dismissed them as soon as possible. But Luther took his with utmost seriousness, and he prayed on the stones, and he fasted, and he embarrassed the monks, and especially the head of the monastery, because that sort of thing had been distinctly out of fashion for a long time by the early 16th century. And in order to get rid of him and the embarrassment that he created, they found an errand for him in Rome and sent him to Rome. And he went there barefoot, with no money, begging his food and lodging on the way, which monks in those days did, and arrived in the great city, the center of Christendom, where he saw the clergyman carried on litters wearing cloths of gold, through hordes of beggars and the poor. And this disgusted him. He went back to the monastery, still in embarrassment, and finally they wrote a recommendation and he received a position as professor of philosophy at the University of Wittenberg, 35 years old unknown, 
beginning to teach. And it was at that time that Pope Leo, very learned, very polished, very sophisticated, decided to raise some money to finish the St. Peter's Basilica designed by Michelangelo and sent emissaries throughout Europe selling indulgences, which were pardons against sin. If you had enough money and wanted to sin, you could pay now and sin later. <laughs> Letters of credit on heaven, so to speak. And Luther, indignant at this nonsense, nailed a challenge to that practice against the doors of the church at Wittenberg. Now, here at this gathering a few years back, I spoke about how the wandering printers came along and translated and spread that challenge throughout Europe. So I won't go into that now. But at the time when the challenge reached the Pope, he said, Oh, a drunken German. When he slept off his wine, he will be of another mind. But the people of Wittenberg were quite excited, and so were people in other parts of Europe. And surprisingly enough, even the elector of Saxony, the ruler in the area that Luther lived, agreed with him. Because these were ideas that had been simmering below the surface of all Western Europe for some time, which suddenly broke through. Now, you have to understand what conditions were like, because as the waters of the Reformation began to flow across Europe, first in inches and then in feet and then in yards, and they began to upset the people of Western Europe, in, for instance, the Low Countries. The Church issued a decree saying that anyone who disobeyed, anyone who shared the arguments of Luther and the Reformation, would be punished. Women who fell into heresy would be buried alive. And men, if they took it back, would lose their heads, and if they did not, would be burned alive. That was power. And those were the conditions. And by that time, Luther was standing against this enormous Leviathan. The elector of Saxony received word from Rome that the Pope wanted to see Luther personally. And of course, everybody knew what that meant. So he refused to send him. He asked Erasmus to come to Wittenberg to advise him, and Erasmus arrived with his retinue, his servant, his valet, his barber, etc., and said, Luther has committed two crimes. One, he has touched the Pope's crown, and the other, he has touched the monk's belly. Now, I think it's at this point we should stop and consider the situation because, in my opinion, we have been grossly mis misled about the nature of the Reformation. It was not simply a religious dispute. It was a resistance to tyranny. It was a demand for intellectual freedom, for the right to question authority, for the right to speak in accordance with one's conscience, for the right to stand up, for the right to be safe, for the right not to be terrorized, for having a mind and an opinion, and the ability to state that opinion openly. This was a blow for freedom. Luther stood for freedom at a time when the very word had almost vanished from vocabulary of men. And the modern historians do not teach this 
to their students. And by not teaching it, they are committing an intellectual crime of stupendous proportions. That Christian students, that the descendants of Christians, should have this blotted out of their lesson is immoral, is a betrayal of the truth. And meanwhile, all Europe looked at Erasmus. All intellectuals looked at the great intellectuals. The darling of the princes and the pope, the scholars in the universities, what did he have to say? Everyone asked him to stand up. Who was right, Luther or the Pope? Freedom or conventionality? As to me, he wrote, the Archbishop of Canterbury in England, I have no inclination to risk my life for the truth. We have not all strength for martyrdom, and if trouble comes, I shall imitate St. Peter. Popes and emperors can settle the creed. If they settle them well, so much the better. If ill, I shall keep on the safe side. He called this moderation, and he advised everyone on all sides to practice it. Meanwhile, the storm raged. The church used murder and torture fire and faggot. It's amazing that the historians of the period glide so smoothly over that. They're so intent upon the excesses of the reformers that they forget the church's reaction to dissent. Fox's Book of Martyrs, at one time a staple in every Protestant home. Now there's hardly anyone alive who has ever read it. No television series is ever going to be made about the Christian martyrs of the Reformation or, for that matter, of under paganism. No special school courses will be taught on Christian history in our schools, and you can bet on that. Now, I will not digress into the theological issues of the Reformation because we haven't time. And my point is how the Reformation emerged and what it emerged against. Because we are in the midst, or we are on the verge, let me say, of a new Reformation. And I want you to understand that the first Reformation was not the result of institutions or groups but of individuals, of individual men and women who stood up. There were regions where there was no elector of Saxony to protect those who arose, no loyal townspeople. Heresy was met with fire and sword, and Lutheranism, as it progressed through Europe, beyond Germany, after Luther's death, permeated Anglicanism and Arminianism, became heavy with compromises and half-measures, and they could not compete in those areas where they weakened. They could not compete against Philip II, the emperor, with all his soldiers, or with the princes of Lorraine, who threatened Scotland and France, and the Huguenots, and Calvin. It took Calvin to raise the standard based on the Bible and especially on the Old Testament. Why the Old Testament? Because he found there a divine system of government. And under Calvin at Geneva, sins were treated as crimes. John Knox, who learned there said of Geneva later, Elsewhere the word of God is taught as purely, but never anywhere have I seen God obeyed as faithfully. You recall that Knox 
in his conversion of Scotland, wanted to put Mary Stuart on trial for the murder of her husband. It horrified Elizabeth I. Imagine putting a sovereign on trial for breaking the law. But the whole point that Knox taught Scotland, and he called the Scottish people the congregation, was that everybody is under God's law. This was a great revolution in political terms, just as it was a great revolution in religious terms. Why isn't it taught here in this land as the laying of the cornerstones of liberty? Well, because it involves the innovation, the sacrifices, the heroism, and the intellects of Christians in their struggle to create a Christian society in a depraved world. Proved the great 19th century English historian from whose writings I've culled these examples, said, Calvinists have been called intolerant. Intolerance of an enemy who is trying to kill you seems to me a pardonable state of mind. <laughs> it's no easy matter, he said, to tolerate lies clearly convicted of being lies under any circumstances, especially when it is not easy to tolerate lies which strut about in the name of religion. But there is no reason to suppose that the Calvinists in the beginning would have thought of meddling with the church if they had themselves been let alone. The Catholics chose to add to their creed a fresh article that they were entitled to hang and burn those who differed from them. And in this quarrel, the Calvinists, Bible in hand, appealed to the God of battles. It was natural that they should. Now, of course, the Reformation reformed the Catholic Church as well as the rest of Europe. The Counter-Reformation came into being. The Catholic Church, the prelates pulled up their socks they stopped behaving so badly because it was no longer safe for them to do so. But to murder people who dissent is a fashion that has re-arisen. Try it in the Soviet Union and see what happens. But the Counter-Reformation and the Soviet Union and so forth are later developments. Let me remind you that all of the few men I have cited, Erasmus, Luther, Calvin, and Knox, started out as individuals with no associations or help at all. They had no inherited wealth and only modest backgrounds. Only Erasmus spent his life in circumstances of comfort, and it is interesting to note that his failure to stand up and choose one side or the other, destroyed his reputation among his contemporaries. He went to his grave loaded with the contempt of those who had formerly admired him because to the end he twisted and evaded. His posthumous reputation has been lifted up since by anti-Christians who themselves lived lives of twisting and evasion, skepticism and agnosticism. They know who they admire. Calvin had to flee France for his life and found sanctuary in Protestant Switzerland. John Knox was captured by the French shortly after his conversion. I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis who said, first, you're converted, you think everything is wonderful, and God says, stand over here and gives all the goodies to the newcomers. Calvin Knox was converted and then became a galley slave. Chained to the oar at a time when the slaves in the galleys of France were worked to death just as thoroughly as slaves are worked to death in the forced labor camps of the Soviet today. Luther, penniless and an embarrassment to his fellow monks, died after many trials, many tests. 
To assume that these men lived in times that are easier than these would be false. It would be to misunderstand history. And also, we have to understand, I think, that it was not primarily religion that roused them so much as anti-religion, a false church, a fraudulent clergy, a despotic government, a feckless literati, people of the lie, lording it over people of faith. That's what aroused them. And it's interesting to note that the names that shine today, centuries later, are those who did not get afraid. They rose when everybody else cringed. Erasmus, nothing. Today, when we see some Christian clergymen hailed by the enemies of Christianity, we don't need to know any more about them than that. In looking back, like the army I mentioned at the beginning, we see certain outcomes as having been determined by the intervention of God. We see that some of those of unshakable faith suffered both martyrdom and terror, but that their cause triumphed. Not forever, not forever, not for every generation. For it is part of the folly of mankind to reject the lessons of its predecessors. And we are not today among those generations whom God has decided to allow to live in times of comfort. We are among those generations that God has chosen to be tested and to suffer for the faith. It is not for us to live in times of peace and tranquility. Quite the contrary. Torture and thought control have reappeared in our time. And the seeds of those practices have been planted in our universities, and in our media, in our political system, in our government, and even among our clergy. We face the same problems that confronted the early reformers. We are subjected to the same elegant depreciations that made Erasmus rich and famous and that left everyone bereft and unimproved. We see the same haughty powers of mighty governments and the same forces of repression rising on all sides. The same hatred of Calvinism and Protestantism, the same efforts to silence us. In time, if these trends that are so powerful abroad continue their rise here at home, we will see the same slavery and silence in this country that now darkens half the globe. Who will rise to re meet that challenge? Only the Christian who stand for freedom and against tyranny. The Christian community was responsible for the rise of individual rights, of free speech and free worship, of representative government, of science and art and medicine and innovation. No ghetto ever brought freedom to the world. No other race or people or culture spread freedom and liberty and intellectual bread to the world excepting the Christian. Every other culture and civilization ever created was a closed system. Ours is the only one that was an open system. The Christian civilization even today provides all the innovation and advances, medical, scientific, artistic, cultural, that the world lives on. We remain the hope of the world. How then do we regain the truth? I promised that I would tell you this morning how we regain the truth. By descending, by expanding, and by supporting on all levels 
intellectual, political, academic, artistic, professional, and personal, the tenets and the history and the glory of our faith. Thank you.